Welcome to Foundstone Conversations, a series we're having with a number of business leaders and sector leaders, uh, essentially listening to what they're, what they're learning, what they're seeing and hearing across a number of different sectors, and sharing real life insights based on their own lived experience uh, to share with other business leaders and sector leaders. Today, we're, we're looking uh, across the healthcare and aged care sectors, and we're joined uh, by Paul Sadler, Welcome, Paul. Hello, thanks, Andrew. Good to have good to have you on. Uh, there's a there's a, certainly a bit happening across the healthcare and age sector at the moment, isn't there? It's uh, um, there's a lot in the media. There's a lot across the industry um, conversations. Uh, so we thought we'd we'd uh, get you on today and and have a conversation about uh, what you're seeing across the industry, uh, a bit about your own your own personal journey and your own career across aged care in particular. And then perhaps looking at the Aged Care Royal Commission that's come out, um, you know, there's a there's a lot of detail within that report. So trying to trying to listen to what you're seeing out out there in terms of how organisations could potentially distill that down into more practical areas. So it's great to have you on. If we start if we start in terms of your your career within the aged care sector, can you tell us a bit about um, your journey um, so far? Certainly. I started off in the sector actually as a social worker um, right back in the, uh, the 1980s um, and worked uh, with uh, older people and their carers as a carer support worker, then did some time uh, in the aged care assessment team at Hornsby Hospital. I then transferred into the New South Wales Government uh, Office on Ageing, doing policy work around um, ageing and aged care issues. Uh, ended up my time in the state government managing the home and community care program statewide for um, New South Wales. And then uh, spent seven years as CEO of Aged and Community Services New South Wales ACT, uh, which is the peak body for the not-for-profit sector. Uh, and spent the last 14 years uh, as CEO at Presbyterian Aged Care. Very good, very good. It's um, was well, fascinating to hear that you know, your, your start of your journey was, you know, in the front in, in the front line in terms of uh, social care. And I think that regardless of what industry, but in particular healthcare and aged care, what we're facing now, I think to have that background and, and lived experience is, is significant. It, look, it makes a, 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 all the difference to have spent some time sitting in people's homes or visiting them in residential aged care and actually hearing firsthand their concerns, understanding what the impact of their family or home circumstances are on their choices that are available to them in the aged care system. And I guess over that 35 odd year period, I've seen aged care transform dramatically. Um, there are some, still plenty of things, as the Royal Commission has pointed out, that we need to do better. But there's also a very different feel to um, aged care now than there was 35 years ago. So if we just look at that point in terms of, you know, you know, decades ago, even up to 30 years ago, to where we are now, um, what do you see that the biggest positive shifts and, and perhaps some of the some of the challenges looking backwards um, over those you know, 10, 20 or 30 years? Is there any, anything that stands out in your mind? where we've made good traction or perhaps the areas where, where we haven't, um, which then we can look at the forward facing. Yeah, two things that immediately spring to mind on the positive of that side of things. When, when I started uh, working um, at Hornsby Hospital and particularly the work I did in the aged care assessment team, you know, you'd, you'd visit residential aged care services back then and, and they were, you know, Florence Nightingale wards, they were um, very, um, poor quality in, in many instances. Uh, although the Royal Commission has shown significant issues still stay in residential care, the, the, the focus on improving the quality of the built form has been massive in that 30 years. I mean, aged care services that are being built now are dramatically different from a model of 30 plus years ago. You would expect that, mm -hmm. but, but that has largely been to the good. And one of the things the Royal Commission picked out was the importance of the small household model. Mm -hmm. um, and they're certainly recommending that's a focus for residential care accommodation into the future. Well, you know, 
some of those models have been around for a long time. There were cottages being built in you know, the, the 1990s uh, in, in aged care. So we're relearning some of the things that we, we've learned before. The second big shift, of course, was the shift in the last, it's mainly been in the last decade towards consumer directed care and a greater focus on person centred care. And I, I, um, when I was at Presbyterian Aged Care, we participated in some of the early trials of consumer directed care in home care. And th there's no question that that focus on what older people need and what their goals for their life are has made a big difference to the way in which we're providing help to older people. Uh, right. and it's much more person-centred now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 fascinating. And the, the term you use in terms of relearning, I think that that probably sums it up fairly well. If if everyone across the industry is re, is, is honest with with um, in terms of where we are, um, perhaps you know, some of the lessons. Um, and I'm sure there's there are reasons behind it, but I think relearning and Hopefully, as you mentioned, in terms of where we are now and the momentum behind it, and the focus from a public a yep. public view is going to going to turn it into a positive. So, in terms of the the Aged Care Royal Commission, there was a, obviously a fair fair lead up to it. It's been it's been uh, now in the public, and the the government are making a response, as I understand, in, in around May end of May. Uh, you know, there's a huge amount of detail in that um, in, in across very very um, items across the industry. Just at a very broad level to start with, where do you see, you know, there's, there's differences with the, with the two commissioners in terms of some of their recommendations. Indeed. How are you looking at that, you know, from a, how they did the report and where we're landing with that right at the moment? Yeah, look, I think the Royal Commission has been a, an absolutely vital um, piece of work for the whole sector. Uh, you know, unquestionably, there were some of us who were pretty, um, concerned, worried about what it might mean. And, mm -hmm. and there's been a lot of negativity, a lot of negative stories, but you know they've happened, they need to be faced up to. And mm -hmm. I think the Royal Commission process has done us all a service by actually addressing those issues, getting them out on the table. Uh, you know, some of its conclusions about why the sector has had the problems it's had uh, are quite confronting. Mm. They're confronting about provider governance and, and gaps in the systems that providers have. They're confronting for government because they've really called them out for uh, really having an approach of bare minimum funding for the mm. sector, uh, you know, uh, and the the the. Uh, the lack of focus on properly funding the system, both in terms of its um, meeting demand for care uh, and in terms of the indexation approach that they've taken for a couple of decades now, which has gradually eroded the capacity of aged care providers to provide the care uh, levels that, that are required. I mean, the, the Royal Commission's you know, basically found that the government has underfunded aged care to the tune of 58% compared with where it should be funded. So it, instead of it being roughly $20 billion, it should be $30 billion or more. Mm. Now, that you know, somewhere that money's got to come from, and you mentioned the difference between the commissioners. One of the areas where there is some difference is how that should be financed into the future. Uh, and you know, I, I think what we now have is the situation where because of the differences between the two commissioners, there'll be some areas where government can pick and choose. Mm. And that's probably not ideal, um, but and, and there will need to be a continued focus from all of us in the sector in working with government to make sure they get it right in response. Yeah, I suppose on, on your point there in terms of the, the differences between the two commissioners, I mean, suppose we have to look at it in a, well, if you look at it from a positive perspective, it forces the conversation around what is the best way forward. It Although does. probably you'd say, well, we're delaying things. We would hope to think that by, by that, you know, there's genuine conversation in the community to get the right long-term because it has to be a big shift, doesn't it? 
So, I look, it does. Uh, but I mean, you know, that quantum of money is massive, you know, mm. particularly in a budget that's been, you know, hit badly by the impact of COVID. Yes. You know, uh, and, and there are many sectors that are calling out for money, you know, tourism, mm. airlines, you know, but with genuine still needs mm. as a consequence mm. of the COVID um, pandemic. So, yeah, there's absolutely going to be um, a lot of calls on government for money. They're going to have to prioritise those. They're going to have to work out what they think they can afford for aged care. If I go back to your question about, you know, what what did I pick out as a couple of the key themes from the Royal Commission? The first one, and Mike Baird made this comment in a, an article in the City Morning Herald uh, mm -hmm. recently, is it's yeah. workforce, workforce, workforce. Mm. is you know one of the key components of, of uh, that's come out from the royal commission uh, and we can dig into that in a little more in a second the other big one that i picked out was uh, so many of the bad cases that the royal commission looked at were fundamentally about breakdowns between the health sector and the aged care sector mm. and so that relationship between health and aged care i think is another big theme that the royal commission has hit on yeah, I think uh, I did see that article from from Mike Baird, as you called out there, and it sounds like that again we can go into a bit more detail. And I've heard you talk about workforce before, and then what that actually means at a grassroots level. Um, the other point you made, you know, the the relationship between the broader health sector and aged care is is certainly one. If I've if I've got it right, in terms of the shifting away from um, well, shifting towards the right the rights based aged care system, and to be more along the lines of the principles of Medicare. If it'd be good to get your view on that in terms of the how realistic is that, and is it a matter of you know edging towards that in a stage approach? Is that the way you see it? How it's been called out, or whether a pretty pretty significant shift could happen sooner rather than later in that in that area? Yeah, there's a couple of key things uh, that the Royal Commission has called out. If, if I go to the relationship between the health and aged care sector first, mm -hmm. one of the things they've highlighted is a need to actually put into the National Health Reform Agreement a clear statement about what aged care is actually responsible for in terms of health delivery for older people mm -hmm. and what the broader health system, public health and, um, you know, primary care, GPs and so forth are responsible for. And I think that's really essential because at the moment it's, it's often unclear who's got responsibility for what. Say, you know, a person has wounds. Um, mm. Yeah, obviously the residential aged care service or a home care service has got a significant role to play in looking after the wounds for the person. But... You, you're relating with GPs, you're relating with potentially hospitals if people have to go in and out of those. So understanding what is the responsibility, say, of the GP in a primary care sense, you know, they clearly have to take a lead mm. on health care for older people. Mm. Uh, and just because, for example, you're in residential aged care doesn't mean you're not entitled to receive health care from other yeah. places. Um, yeah. so, mm -hmm. so that needs to be clear. And uh, the, the Royal Commission is quite clear that the incentives are wrong in multiple parts of the system around care of older people. Mm -hmm. GPs don't feel they get integrated <laughs> sufficiently if they go into a residential care setting. Yes. The communication between us, which we'll come to technology a little later, you know, is patchy. Um, mm -hmm. Those things need to be improved. So does the skills and the responsibility by aged care providers around clinical care, which is a big issue that the Royal Commission has identified. On the question of how is it all going to be paid for, the Royal Commission, is, and, and, and you mentioned it, Mike Baird from Hammond Care talked about it in his uh, City Morning Herald article, the, uh, the comparison with Medicare is, is very important. Yeah, there, at the moment, if you need a, uh, a Medicare service, you can go to a public hospital and you mm -hmm. can be treated for free if you need to be. You can choose to be a private patient and mm -hmm. you can choose mm -hmm. to pay and you get some additional service if you do that. You can go to a GP and you know, most GPs will bulk bill. Mm -hmm. In the aged care system, you can be assessed as needing a home care package 
there's no guarantee we'll ever get one. Mm. Yeah, the waiting times are too long. Yes. The, yeah, the fact you get assessed as needing a service does not automatically mean that you will actually get that service. Now, we know there are waiting lists for public funded um, hospital care too. Yes. So, yeah, if you need a specialist mm -hmm. intervention, you might be on a waiting list for, you know, six months um, if it's, you know, elective surgery. Mm -hmm. So the, I don't think we should think that an entitlement means that you will just automatically get everything for free in the aged mm -hmm. care system. That's not how the health system works under Medicare. Yeah, true. But, but what is absolutely true at the moment is that the aged care system is rationed deliberately by government. Um, mm. So you can be assessed as needing something. You will not get what you're assessed as needed um, uh, necessarily or ever. And, and that's what the Royal Commission has called out. It's what Mike Baird was talking about. Yeah, that needs to change. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, it's a kind of a confronting term. And that's what's happening. It's being rationed by government. But it's, it's like you say, it's what, it is what is actually happening. In terms of then... You know, console, as I understand, there's a move to consolidate the different care packages down into a single program or, or platform. Uh, that's That would be no easy easy feat, would it, to do that? Where no, do you, no that that absolutely won't be. Even the Royal Commission itself yeah. is saying that the, the elements of that wouldn't come together till 2024. Right. So you're talking mm -hmm. about, you know, three, four-year period. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the expectation when uh, you know the sector and government sit down and look at the detail of the work that needs to be done is it might be even a bit longer than that I think right. because right. Uh, this is a big change you know, it's mm -hmm. like moving the Titanic off its mm -hmm. direction you know, uh, mm -hmm. this will take time and you have to continue to deliver the support to yes. people who are already in the system in the meantime yeah. Um, the, the, what they've recommended is that uh, the various different aspects of the aged care system, Commonwealth Home Support, which is currently the low level services, home care packages, short term restorative care uh, and residential aged care should all be brought together in, as you said, a single aged care program. Mm -hmm. But they've also suggested that that single aged care program would be characterised into th five different categories of mm -hmm. support. Mm -hmm. So they've called out a respite category a social support category, which would pick up in, uh, anything to do that supported social isolation um, or people who were socially isolated. So things like yeah. community transport, Meals on Wheels, as well as social support groups or centre-based daycare. Third category is assistive technology and home modifications. Uh, and then they've called out the creation of a care at home um, category. That would largely replace home care packages, but also some other aspects of Commonwealth home support, like personal care, uh, domestic assistance, nursing, allied health. Uh, and then the final category is residential aged care. Now, on the face of it, you might say, oh, that sounds like they're not recommending much change to residential aged care because it would still be its own category. But no, it, when you look at the detail of what they've recommended, they've actually got quite a lot of change proposed for residential aged care. It would become mm -hmm. mandatory to offer care management for people who need coordination of services and mm -hmm. talking about the relationship with the health sector, people yes. in aged care yes. often need relationships outside the mm -hmm. aged care service. Mm -hmm. uh, they've called out a much greater role for allied health provision, mm -hmm. uh, the future of residential care as well. And then as we talked about earlier, they've talked about a new accommodation um, paradigm for the future. Yeah, yeah, that's a... That's a it's a nice clear summary. Thank you for that. It helps it distill in in my mind. I guess the the challenge there you're saying you know the, the moving towards a single this more a single package approach, 2024 and beyond. It's, it sounds a long way away, doesn't it? So do you think one of the biggest challenges is that how how it's going to transition from still delivering quality service and and improving right now, and and the phased approach to that single platform. That seems like one of the biggest challenges that perhaps is going to lie in the next couple of years? I think I think that's exactly right, Andrew. I, I think it will be a challenge, be a challenge for the department, one of the big areas, of course, that the two mm -hmm. commissioners 
differed on was what structure of governance of the sector will, will be put in place. I, I am assuming that is something the government will give us an indication of in May about you know, which direction where we're headed on in that regard. Um, and that will be fairly important because whatever happens to the, whether it's a departmental approach or whether it's um, a, a new aged care commission approach, which was what Commissioner Pagoni recommended, uh, that, that will obviously be fairly fundamental for how we actually move forward. Yeah. But, but I think the, um, there are components of work that the Department of Health already had underway. So, for example, in um, residential care we're, we're about to adopt from probably the middle of next year a new um, aged care classification for funding mm -hmm. uh, and which will replace ACFI and similarly uh, the, the department has already commissioned some work from a group called Health Consult who are looking at a new aged care classification uh, uh, and funding approach for the home care sector. So some of the preparatory work which is flagged in the Royal Commission as necessarily to move forward has already been underway. But any of those changes, if you take just the introduction of the Australian National Aged Care Classification or ANAC as it gets uh, known as, mm -hmm. into residential care, well, any of us who were around when ACFI was introduced will remember that introducing a new funding mechanism mm. is actually a complex process. Yeah. Um, and so it will take time for some of those changes to bed down uh, through the sector. Yeah, interesting. If we circle back to, to the, the, work, the subject of workforce, which you called out as one of the, one of the major areas, as I understand, you know, the commission, the report's gone into some fairly specific detail around calling out, um, you know, even down to number of minutes per resident in terms of, um, you know, caring and, and those sorts of things, trying to move away from the, um, perhaps the um, the approach of, you know, antipsychotics being, being, being uh, provided, perhaps where there are other opportunities to spend more time. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, like you called out, that's, that's a big challenge in terms of getting the right workforce and then the volume of workforce. Um, again, if we look into that in a bit more detail, are there any areas where you see could be, um, providers could perhaps um, look at in, in the shorter term um, with, the, with the longer term changes in view? Yeah, look, there's a couple of recommendations that the Royal Commission's made, which I think providers absolutely should get on board with very quickly. Um, the first is they've, they've called out education and training as a major area. They've actually recommended that the government provide some additional top-up funding to the sector to help um, improve the training uh, and, and qualifications of current workforce. Um, the, the second area that the government responded in its interim response was the need to attract more workers into the sector. And they've um, offered funding uh, to support the recruitment of uh, 18,000 additional workers, particularly in the home care, um, mm -hmm. personal care workers. So there's gonna be some, I think, some short-term investment in recruitment and training. And at, Providers need to be ready to respond to that, take up the opportunities that, that, that are delivered. Mm. Clearly with some of the training areas, that it, there'll also be linkages with TAFE and uh, potentially university sector as well about how some of that's delivered. In terms of the, the bigger challenge uh, is just the, uh, with an aging population, the workforce levels that we need to get to, mm. workforce numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's a significant challenge ahead of us for the next 30 or 40 years to get enough workers to support the ageing population. Yes. And with some of what the government, uh, the Royal Commission has recommended, that, that increases the demand for workforce in the short term. So, for example, if the minimum staffing uh, ratios that are recommended by the Royal Commission are adopted by government, over the next three or four years, we will need to significantly increase the number of workers, both registered nursing workforce and personal care workers in um, residential aged care. And that's happening alongside recommendations to grow the number of home care packages further and to invest further into uh, 
the lower level currently CHSP home care services as well. So there's, um, there's a lot of new workers needed and a lot of training needed. Uh, and that will only happen with a coordinated workforce strategy at a national level. Mm -hmm. Now, some of the components of that were set up by John Pelaez and his um, workforce, aged care workforce strategy a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And we, we now have um, uh, you know, work underway about uh, a, a new um, recruitment campaign that's just been released this week. Um, mm -hmm. well, uh, it's for uh, workers in aged care. So I think, I think there will be a lot happening in that workforce space, but it really is, as I said earlier, it's critical because if we don't get the workers, a lot of what is the goal of the Royal Commission will be very hard to achieve. And we have to recognise that um, this is not just an issue about recruitment uh, and training it links to other issues like immigration. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the workers in, uh, in aged care are people who've come from overseas. Well, the last year and a bit with the pandemic, those doors have been shut tight. Very true. So, so there's going to be you know, some real challenges, I think, going forward about, about whether we can do that. The final thing I must mention is pay. Um, this again was something Mike Baird called out in his article. Uh, workers in aged care are underpaid compared to their colleagues in disability and health, and they're underpaid compared with, you know, the Woolies store down the road. Mm. Uh, that is an indictment on Australia. I mean, why do we think that working with older people is worth less than any of those other sorts of occupations? Mm. And um, the unions have got a case uh, lodged in Fair Work Mm -hmm. uh, the aged care peak bodies, including AXA, are taking a very, um, you know, open approach to basically supporting a case going through uh, to improve uh, wages. But the reality is that uh, aged care providers cannot offer additional, um, you know, wages, yes. uh, pay rates, mm -hmm. unless government funds the sector to do it. So it has to be, which the Royal Commission said, a tripartite approach, unions on behalf of the employees, employers through the aged care peak bodies and government all being party to an approach that actually guarantees an increase in wages. Yeah, well, if you link back to your, your earlier comment to uh, potentially, you know, 58% underfunded across the sector, that, that, you know, gives a magnitude of the, of the potential, you know, significant gap, and I think you 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 rightfully call out there the link to the other societal issues like immigration that is going to feed into this in a very practical sense, isn't it? So yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you're going to resolve workforce issues, mm -hmm. um, you've got to look at all levers available to government, employers, and workers themselves. You know, you, you, you've got to have a, 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 a what open an approach as possible. I mean, the um, if, if you just look at it from a worker's point of view, the majority of our workforce are mature aged women. Mm -hmm. uh, they've often got family responsibilities, uh, maybe for children, uh, certainly now often for their mm -hmm. own older parents. Mm -hmm. So yeah, flexibility is really critical for um, those people. And, and uh, by and large, the existing system is reasonably flexible, but of course, some of that flexibility means people work across different providers. Mm. What happened when the pandemic started? Oh, you've got to stop and only pick one organisation that you will work for and one site for that organisation. Well, that's a huge challenge from a workforce management point of view in, in the aged care sector at the moment. Uh, and so there are some things that have happened out of COVID, which, which really challenge, I think, some of the assumptions about how we're going to solve some of these workforce problems going forward. Uh, and I, I don't necessarily have solutions for all of those at this point. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, I think you've highlighted them nicely. In terms of, if we look at the next, next part of, and I've heard you talk about it in the, uh, before, in terms of uh, digital and technology. So across, you know, Healthcare, you know, embedding the right digital and technology solutions is still very much a challenge. 
I've heard you talk about before that, you know, as a, as a CEO within aged care, you know, you and your teams are getting approached on a very regular basis by technology providers, uh, vendors, with, with all sorts of different solutions. And, I, and you've talked about, in reality, there's only, there's really a, a number of key large scale technology implementations you can do over 12 months or 24 months. We see a number of solution providers in, in healthcare and aged care specifically. Um, you know, a lot of them are genuinely wanting to engage better to, to either, either shape or build products that are better suited to solving these problems. Uh, it'd be good to hear about what your experience has been in that space. What's worked well? You know, technology providers you know, coming to you as a CEO or, or yep. your team, and perhaps what what is the wrong way to do that as well? Yeah, it, there's no question technology is going to be a big part of the future. It, it'll be a part of the future for two basic reasons. First is the workforce challenge that we were just talking about. So anything that helps efficiency for the workforce helps... A, uh, providers be efficient in how they manage the workforce and, you know, actually provides relief on the ground for some of the tasks that a, a paid workforce would otherwise have to do. They're all going to be helpful going forward, any of those sorts of technologies. Mm -hmm. The other big driver, though, is this relationship with the health sector that we were talking about earlier. And one of the things the Royal Commission has called out is um, a need to integrate with my health record into the mm -hmm. future. Um, so I think what, what organisations are going to be looking for from technology providers is um, are you providing something that is actually needed on the ground uh, or is it just something you've dreamt up that's a good idea? Mm. Is it something which, when it comes to how it will be implemented, is going to integrate well with the other software um, and technology systems that providers are already using? And third, will it meet some of these new criteria like integration with my health record, which are likely to become priorities over the next few years? In terms of what it's like to be on the receiving end, um, I was just chatting with uh, Peter Newing, my former uh, CIO at uh, Presbyterian HK yesterday, and he was saying that he'd recently attended the ITAC online conference. Mm -hmm. and there was there's a, a lot of sense of uh, digital technology providers saying, oh, now the Royal Commission reports out, let's go and knock on everybody's door and, you know, mm -hmm. we've, we have we got the answer for you. Yes. The reality is most organisations, um, be they big, small or medium size, are going to struggle to deal with more than two or three implementations happening mm. you know, in a year. Um, it's just, yeah, there, there's only so much headspace um, and, you know, when you've got all these other training requirements for your staff that we were talking about earlier, that, yes. are, um, you know, uh, that are all around aspects of clinical or personal care interactions, and then you've got your WHS stuff you need to look after, you've got, you know, everything else going on. Mm. Finding space to actually put in new technology is, it's got to be the right technology that meets a need that the organisation actually can see and touch and feel in the here and now. Mm. And it's also got to be um, as smooth a process as possible. And those integration points with other systems are you know, massive in that regard. Mm. Yeah, that's, I think it's, that's, that's uh, really practical. So it's, it's good to hear your, both your, your experience and what you see in the future for that sort of things. In terms of the, some of the strategy work we, we do, uh, Foundstone, at the heart of it is, is getting organisations and leaders to, to go out into the community, into their customer, uh, into their, their patient base, and literally listen to what is the lived experience of, of that person, that the human, yep. and, the, and the family and then the community surrounding that. What's, what's your view? The, and it's, a, it's, it's a very, I mean, simplistic term, you know, listen to, listening to a lived experience. But do you see that, you know, there's, there's ways, you know, like human-centered design, those kind of processes and methodologies. Um, um, do you see that being, being critical in terms of the report has been released, we're getting government announcements soon, but still for, for providers to be very close to the community and the people they're either serving now or looking to serve and listening to their lived experience? 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, one of the key points the Royal Commission has made was too often we haven't done that. Mm. So we, we've designed systems and processes and government has designed systems and processes that really aren't very people friendly at all. Mm. And, and that's people friendly both for um, older people and their families, but also for the staff who mm. have to implement them. Yes. Yeah, so it, it needs to be a much more person-centred approach. And, and uh, yeah, I think you're right that the start of, of that has to be talking to older people, their families, understanding your local community. Most of my work has been with not-for-profit organisations and they're nearly all based in community. Now, whether that's a religious community, an ethnic community or a geographic community, that purpose for existence is got to be core to how you think about everything you do, including new technology options or service models that you're, you might be looking to design and implement. So yeah, you, you, you must start with understanding what a, 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 a piece of technology will do for real people in the real world as a starting point. Um, and similarly, uh, you know, in the strategic planning work you do or I'll be doing in my you know, consultancy business going forward, you've, you've got to be helping people to connect with um, what are older people and you know, the people with disabilities, carers, whoever, going to need now and into the future. Uh, and that's got to be the, the core of driving, whether it's technology, whether it's business um, strategy, whether it's service model design. Yeah, and I think that feeds back into one of the headlines in terms of the, the rights-based aged care system in the report. Uh, there's, there's probably there's one thing to talk about that, isn't there? But it's the, it's the, as you said, you know, engaging with all those communities at a very grassroots level, at a very human, human-centred level, which I think it really it, it, where it needs to start in, in our view, and I'm, uh, I've, I've heard you talk about that in the past. I think, Paul, to, to wrap it up in terms of you know, it's been wonderful listening to your past experience and what you're seeing in the future. Is there any, is there perhaps a couple of things around guidance uh, for aged care providers, you know, leaders, boards within that, within the, the industry that the reports here, I know you've covered some of it, perhaps just to wrap up, is there a couple of things that providers could be doing in a very practical sense that, get, that can get us moving in the right direction? Yeah, look, I, I think priority number one is understand what is in the Royal Commission report and what um, some of its key themes actually are or what they might mean for you. So some of the work I've, I've started doing uh, in uh, the, my Paul Sadler consultancy business is talking to whether it's individual providers or groups of providers about look, get your head around what the Royal Commission has found, hmm. what its key directions are, and there are already some things you can you can start doing. We talked in the workforce area about be ready for training, uh, that funding, be ready for some of the new recruitment opportunities that are likely to come from government as part of that. But in terms of um, you know, thinking about uh, a human rights-based aged care act, the changes to uh, that are flagged to a single aged care program, there are some things you can begin doing. So I've been talking, um, with social, uh, social support providers in New South Wales about what's that going to look like for them. You know, if, if there is this new social supports category established in the future and there are some changes to funding and it's coming under a single aged care act, have, what could you be prepared for? There are some things you can do at the governance level that are already quite clearly flagged in the um, commission report. There are some things you could look at around volunteer management that are flagged in the report. So you can have a look uh, even now and say, what are we prepared for? You don't necessarily need to do all that much for the next two months because we've got to wait and see what government is going to pick up out of this. All we have at the moment is a set of recommendations. We don't know for sure which ones are going to be adopted. The one thing the government did say, though, is it is going to rewrite the Aged Care Act. So yeah. that will be happening. And I, clearly what is written in the Royal Commission's report will be the basis of how they're likely to do that. And I think that that, that, that loops back to your you know, original comment in terms of relearning across the sector to take the, to take the experiences and the learnings from that over the last, the last you know, decades and years 
and to really have them, you know, so that we can create the, the actual large scale changes needed. So Paul, it's been wonderful chatting. Thank you for sharing your, your own lived experiences from your, your various CEO roles over the time and, and where it's heading. Um, looking forward to hearing a bit more around some of your insights um, when over the next couple of months from the government announcements um, and look forward to keeping in touch. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Paul. Cheers.